Today I want to uh, share some observations on California red table wines. It's a particularly good time, I think, from your point of view to talk about this because uh, although we are in a shortage period just now, uh, we will not be in a shortage period forever. And when there is more Cabernets to play with and more Pinots to play with and so forth, uh, your generation will have the chance to make um, the great wines that should be made from them and to age them properly and so forth. So it's always difficult to have normal operations in a period when the demand is greater than the supply. All kinds of uh, abnormal things happen during that period. When that's reversed and the supply is greater than the demand, then um, a different set of factors operate and a great deal more attention is paid to winemaking. And that comes out in the general problems that are um, taking place right today in California. It's pretty hard to buy an aged red wine in California at the moment, in any place in the state. Um, this is not to say that every red wine, every red table wine must be old. That's not correct. But uh, some red wines do benefit by aging and just try and find any of them on the market. There certainly has been a lot of overcropping. There's a lot of Cabernets. I just attended a tasting yesterday afternoon of some eight Cabernets, of which I would guess that at least four of them were from overcropped vines. They were low in alcohol. They were thin in body. They were not very well colored. And they were at the same time, they were fairly low in, in um, acid. Now, last year, that may have been due to uh, the early rains that we had, but that's not true for these particular wines. These were wines that are three years old now, and yet they had this um, uh, overcropped characteristic. There's a general sameness uh, about uh, many of the wines, that they are blended to some standard, which is not too far different from the standards of other competing wineries. Uh, and I'll have that, something to say about that with respect to Cabernets in a few moments. And uh, even to buy a special wine is uh, rather difficult at the present time. There are not very many large set-asides. Even when the winery does, for prestigious, prestige purposes, set aside some wine, they only set aside a few hundred cases, and it's all gone uh, within the first few days. And there's quite a bit of high prices without high quality going on in California at the present time. Something that I've complained about from other countries uh, has now reached California in a rather big and embarrassing way at times. Uh, new wines uh, hardly having lost their uh, yeastiness uh, being offered at prices of 6 and 7 and $8 a bottle, and you're expected to take it. Uh, so far, I'm not. Well, we'll talk about seven or eight different varieties now, and I'll try and tell you something about what the procedures that we might use for producing them and what kind of wines they might make. Undoubtedly, the most prestigious variety in California and the one that's produced the greatest wines, in my opinion, has been Cabernet Sauvignon. I was interested in the um, Saturday, um, Friday, Friday, uh, newspaper reports of uh, when Mr. Uh, Martini Sr. was asked in San Francisco uh, on Thursday what his favorite wine was, that he thought the 1940 Cabernets were very good, but he liked some of his old Zinfandels very much also. Uh, but I think in general, most of the people would say that the greatest California red wine so far produced were Cabernet Sauvignon. And there are two schools of thoughts about making Cabernet, and they, you can see it in the valley, uh, all the time, irrespective, uh, w without consideration of the overcropping, which perhaps uh, is a third type of thing. Uh, whether it should be 13% alcohol or 12% alcohol, whether it should be the ca so-called California style of Cabernet Sauvignon or whether it should be more on the French style of the Cabernet family of wines from Bordeaux. Uh, the 1936 vintage established this difference very well as compared with the 1935 vintage. The 1936 vineyard was a year of small crops because of the spring frost and uh, then a very warm August. So that the Cabernets uh, were made at uh, 
about 13 to 13 and a half percent of alcohol. And so the, and they became the established types for the greatest California Cabernets, Beaulieu's Private Reserve, 1936 and so forth, were known for a long, long time. Whereas the 1935 had been a year of very cool weather and a moderately high crop, and the result was that those wines were all 11.5 to 12 percent alcohol. And Inglenook made some wines in the 1935 style that were also very much admired. And at the present time, you find both types of Cabernet Sauvignons on the market. Some in the 1936 style, which are the high alcohol ones with the ripe grape smell. Uh, the berries are not picked, or the grapes are not picked until there's a certain amount of of uh, shriveling of the berries, uh, and you get this slight raisin character in them, and that is perhaps the most prestigious one that has been produced, but you will also find uh, some of the 12% Cabernets with less Cabernet odor, no raisining character at all, and uh, some of the Inglenooks, some of the early Inglenooks, some of the later Inglenooks fell into that style and uh, were greatly admired as well. Uh, the, at the just in passing, I might point out that at the Krug Winery, both styles have been produced. The 1959 Krugs, for example, were wines from the overcropped category or the the overripe category, and uh, the result was that they're very rich, ripe wines, just maturing now. But many other years at Krug were on the 12 percent side. Well, I've said enough about crop level. If you have overcrop, you have to wait to harvest the grapes and. You, it takes a long time to get the sugar level up, if you ever get it up, and the acid level goes down. The climatic region is, of course, a very important one, but with perhaps with Cabernet not quite so delimiting as it is with some other varieties. Um, the problem with Cabernet Sauvignon in the Davis, Lodi, Fresno area, all of which we've made quite a number of Cabernets is from, is not that they are so unbalanced when harvested, but that any malolactic fermentation at all leads to very flat plaw wines. I'll come back to this in Ruby Cabernet in a few minutes. And uh, it's practically impossible to control this, the, the malolactic fermentation going on almost simultaneous with the alcoholic fermentation. Uh, there is plenty of color because of the small berries uh, and the small surface to volume relationship uh, in Cabernet Sauvignon in Region 4. So that's not the limiting factor. The acid would not be high at best, but it would be at least passably high. But with the lower, really fairly low acid plus a malolactic, the Cabernet then uh, is, um, gets what we call the hot climate smell. It becomes very flat. It gets purple colors. Uh, so much so that uh, we can, I can show you the tasting cards for Cabernet here at Davis. It's called the, the Davis Cabernet smell. And it's very easy to distinguish all of the Cabernets made at Davis and in Region 4 from those from other regions uh, because of that flat, sort of Fresno type of odor that we spoke of earlier. There is some problems in crushing them. Dr. Webb's probably already told you about that as they get late in the season, the uh, pedestals get woody and instead of breaking off uh, at the grape end, the, the clusters are almost entirely taken into the crusher. So if they're really woody, this doesn't make any difference or makes very little difference. If they're just moderately woody, it can make quite a bit of difference. I think that's another reason, as I pointed out during the tour, one of the tours on Friday for the variable speed crushers that if we crushed Cabernets at different speeds depending on how much we broke up the stems, we would have a much better uh, Cabernet musk with a lot less stem material in it. Now, the, the decision as to how long it's going to be on the skins is a decision as to how long you're going to age the wine. Uh, about three-fourths of the Bordeaux Chateaus have now opted for the short aging period. This has all taken place within a period of 10 years uh, before the 1961 vintage all the Bordeaux chateaus were bottling at the summer before the third year was up. Uh, now they're all doing that in the summer of the second year. Uh, so they've uh, decreased the amount of wood aging by a third. Uh, that uh, 
picture translated into different kinds of California winery operation uh, means three and four years if you use the large cooperage. Uh, as for example, the, uh, as uh, Mr. Fuller pointed out very correctly at, uh, at Martini, uh, where the first year or the first two years, or in the case of the Zinfandel, the first three years uh, is all done in fairly large redwood containers. And if you were putting out 13% alcohol Cabernets, and then in those large, very large containers, the to bottling date may be as much as uh, four years. And it frequently has been four years at uh, Martini's. A lot of their Cabernets and Barberas have not been bottled until the fourth year. The larger the cooperage, the longer the delay. The quicker off the skins, the more rapid the bottling process is going to be. And this will also affect the time that the wines are going to come to full maturity. And if I were in Bordeaux, I think it would give me some pause uh, because the idea of Bordeaux's as long aging wines will disappear in, in our generation, because, uh, except for maybe a few wineries which will maintain the long aging period and which will uh, leave them on the skins for seven, eight, nine, and ten days. Uh, and I think this will take something away from the prestige of the Bordeaux industry to be called a rapid aging industry in, in contrast to its long aging image that they've been cultivating for the last 120 years. It doesn't seem to make very much difference what kind of cooperage is used. The big Bordeaux chateaus, as I told you before, use new cooperage. I think the new cooperage is uh, an artifact, in my opinion. It's uh, practically impossible to get clean, used cooperage. Uh, it's too bad you don't see much wood aging, and I don't guess we talked about that on the tours. It's too bad we should have. But it's the very devil to keep 50 gallon barrels empty and if you put them in there put wine in it with uh, mold on the inside then you spoil your your whole wine so th there is an advantage of new cooperage but I don't think it's the advantage is new because it's new I think the advantage is new because it's clean now what should Cabernets taste like well I've touched upon this already if you belong to this rather slow aging ripe grape smell Cabernets then you should pick rather late uh, leave them on the skins for about a week. Uh, be prepared to age them three years before bottling. And uh, try and get your customers or yourself to keep some of it for five or more years before you put it on the market. And that, in the opinion of many, would be the greatest California Cabernet. But, as I pointed out, there is a large school, and I suppose that Bordeaux would be in that school at the present time, Picking earlier to stay around 12 or under in alcohol, taking off the skin somewhat younger, earlier, and uh, less aging in the wood, two years at the maximum, uh, would give another kind of Cabernet, which would mature faster, and uh, if it was uh, uh, not overcropped grapes and so forth to start with, would have a Cabernet flavor and would be quite a pleasant one. This would uh, be what I call the difference between the two California styles. And then I indicated at the beginning that there's a third one, the California Cabernets, which don't have much Cabernet, which either they're blended too much or they're made from overcropped grapes. Yes, you have a question? Are there any California wineries now that are consistently doing the 1936 style wine? Oh, yes. I, private Reserve is that way every year, if they can get it that right. That right. That right. Some years they can't. Good many of the Krug wines are that. Yeah. Some of the other new wineries are. All right, now the Pinot Noir next. I can't tell you why there have been so few successes in, with Pinot Noir in California compared with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, at one time, I remember when John Daniel was still alive at Inglenook, uh, he was able to show 12 or 14 vintages at Inglenook of all high quality Cabernet. Uh, at the same time he was only able to show two or three Pinot Noirs which he took equal care in production with and pruning and so forth and yet that was all the ones that he could say were, were great. There are two probable reasons, maybe three for this, maybe more. One is that the time of ripening, although early there is a great inducement to get the Pinot Noirs off because there is a 
time lag from the time that Gewurz Treminer and Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Noir are ripe and other varieties are ripe. And most people with a crew of pickers don't like to hold them out of the vineyard. They're afraid that their neighbors or other regions will hire them or that they'll go to town and uh, not come back. And uh, so the, the temptation, especially in the larger vineyards, is to keep the crew working. And since Pinot Noir is the next one to pick, the tendency has been to get into the Pinot Noirs before it really gets up to full ripeness. Full ripeness we consider here to be about 13% alcohol, or possibility of producing 13% alcohol. There are undoubtedly some clonal effects. The England clone produced very good wines, but never high color. Uh, whereas the uh, Beaulieu clone uh, produced um, uh, very much more color and much slower aging wines for Pinot Noir. The crop level is absolutely disastrous. There are a couple of vineyards in Santa Clara that were overcropped, and although the wines sold at rather high prices, you could never tell what they were made out of uh, because of the overcropping. So, and this is the general experience in Europe too, that overcropping of Pinot Noir leads to grapes that don't ripen properly and don't have very much Pinot character. It's probable that this is a variety that we're not ever going to have high yields on, no matter what clone we, we use. And the effect of climatic region, uh, that's critical. It's not like Cabernet, where you, you could conceive of, of even warmer regions producing Cabernet, but you can't conceive of that for Pinot Noir. Uh, we picked um, at Delano in 1936 on uh, July the 28th Pinot Noirs. Uh, that's in the hottest time of the year. Average temperatures are over 100. The malic acid is completely uh, metabolized, and the color is, at the best, a slight pink blush at that time. So you, you can't uh, make a Pinot Noir, a red Pinot Noir, down the valley. It's an easy variety to crush. The temperature control is critical. Now, you, you heard different methods of handling this in the different wineries. I am the opinion that we don't know the final answer to the temperature, but Mr. O and I's experiment showed that certainly Pinot Noir has to be fermented at a higher temperature than Cabernet to produce a good flavor. And that means around 80 degrees. Now whether it's better to let the temperature run up to 80, which would be higher than that in the cap, and then cool the whole thing down, or whether it's better to keep it fairly cool the whole time so that the cap or nothing gets above, say, 75, uh, we don't know the answer to that. My personal predilection, without being able to substantiate it, would be that I'd rather let the temperature get up around 80 and then cool and then let it go back up to 80 and then cool again rather than keeping it all the time at 65 or 70. We have some evidence of that, but not very good evidence. Probably in the warm years, it will have to have some acid added. You'll get better color extraction with a higher acid, and you'll get a better balanced wine. The experience at, uh, Mar I'll be in just a second, the experience at Martinis and other wineries is that not only is it impossible to prevent the malolactic fermentation, but in most cases, it's done before you really know that it's, uh, it's there that the, in recent years the malolactic fermentation has been practically simultaneous with the alcoholic fermentation. Yes? Well, Pinot Noir doesn't take an awful lot of day degrees to ripen, you see. It'll ripen around 2,000 and, and ripen fairly well. It may take a little bit longer on the vines to get a little shriveling taking place to raise the sugar content by that method. But you can get, say, 2021 at less than 2,000 day degrees. It's a short ripening period. It's, it's period one ripening. And so it's, that's, that's the reason it's used in Champagne District in Northern Europe is because it does ripen with minimum number of degree days. All right, the use of the press wine. Generally speaking, I would use the press wine if I were doing it. I probably would not in the case of Cabernet, but I certainly would in the case of Pinot Noir. It can't do much harm 
because it's, uh, the variety is low in tannin anyway, and it may help to give the wine a little bit more uh, aging characteristics, which is one of the big failures of our California Pinot Noirs. I would age it in some wood, but I'd keep the wood flavor subdued. The Pinot Noir flavor is rather delicate at best. It doesn't do much harm, you see, to the Cabernet. I said that the wood characteristic wasn't so critical there, just so long as it gets some age and a little wood characteristic. But a Pinot Noir that smells woody, there's not very much Pinot Noir left. So they have to be very careful with that one. And it certainly shouldn't be blended with the non-Pinot wine. I can conceive of a lot of Cabernets that are blended that are as good or better. But I can't conceive of any blending of Pinot Noirs that are better. Yes? Um, if you're fermenting a small cooperage and you want to pump over a lot to get color extraction, will that help color extraction at all? And if so, how can you... Oh, yes, it'll help. It. Any, it depends on how small a cooperage. If you're only fermenting in 50-gallon barrels, well, I'd just punch it down. I wouldn't pump it over. I'd just punch it down like we do at the, at the Knowledge Building. But if you're, going, if you're considering small cooperage 500 gallons, or up to 5,000, you're going to have to pump over. You won't be able to punch down a 500-gallon tank very easily and wear your arms out. Uh, unless you want to get around and swim in it or something like that. <laughs> another, another possibility. All right, don't blend with non-Pinot wine. Now, what should it taste like? What should a good Pinot Noir in California taste like? Well, it should have some ripe Pinot Noir character, and that's what so many of them fail to have. They don't have the ripe Pinot Noir character. Frankly, in our blind tastings, we have been unable to identify as Pinot Noir more than 50% of the commercial Pinot Noirs on the market. That's pretty big condemnation, uh, and uh, it gives me pause, And but I think everybody agrees that we have not succeeded with Pinot Noirs as much as with Cabernets. And so more attention has have to be going to be given to the Pinot Noir. It's not going to be an easy variety to play with or to, to work with, sure way you want to put it, and um, to get that reasonably high alcohol without being flat, uh, to get uh, 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 the color to be reasonably good, and to get that slightly uh, ripe grape Pinot Noir character, or dis not slightly, but distinguishable, ripe grape Pinot Noir character is going to be very hard to do. And there have not been very many of them that way. Otherwise, it's just another red wine and hardly worth all the time and of growing that grape and making that wine. In other words, what I'm saying with Cabernet Sauvignon, you pretty nearly can't go wrong, whether you're in the 13% or 12%. In the Pinot Noir, you certainly can go wrong because if you don't get it ripe, it's just another red grape. And that's why there are so few successes because it requires a lot more attention. If you were going to tackle the, the most difficult problem, I would say that you would have your chance with Pinot Noir. That's the one that no one has all the answers to. The Zinfandel, although greatly liked by many people, Mr. Martini and myself as far as that's concerned, has many problems. For example, the bunch rot problem, especially in Lodi and on the floor of the Napa Valley, uh, where the humidity is higher, uh, many years the bunch rot is a major problem. Aspergillus, in some cases, aspergillus followed by acetic acid uh, bacteria where the grapes have been broken open, fermented, and then they at attack by acetobacter. And you can smell the uh, Zinfandel vines from their, from their vinegar smell. And that has happened in a number of years. Also happens with Carignan, I might point out too. As you get further south, it begins to lack color, although it's not a great, uh, awfully big problem because as you go further south, you get more raisin berries. So you get more skin to volume relationship so that even though you have, and we have had Zinfandels from Fresno and Madeira particularly, we've had a number of them from there, the color has not been too bad because those raisin berries swell up and you get a lot of that color uh, out of them and it tends to give more color to the wine than it would otherwise have. How do you crush raisin fruit, though? That's a real big problem. There's always a loss of sugar. If you try and make a balance in a winery crushing Zinfandels, it never comes out. You get so many tons of grapes, but uh, there's a certain amount of sugar that's lost, and the, uh, the field balling doesn't, doesn't go very well with what you actually get. 
because of the, it's not represented in the raisin fruits. So field sampling is very difficult with Zinfandel, and making an alcohol balance of a wine recrushing Zinfandel is next to impossible. There are three kinds of Zinfandel that have been made in California from the time of the California Wine Association in 1895. Uh, the first was the uh, traditional one, the one I think was made first was the 11% alcohol wine that was sent out in the spring of the year after the vintage. Uh, it didn't have a great deal of Zinfandel character, but it matured very quickly. It was high in acid, and uh, it clarified beautifully. In general, Zinfandels clarify very easily. And so these 11% uh, alcohol wines represented a sort of claret type for the American market. And California Wine Association had uh, at least one and perhaps several of them. The 12% alcohol wine is the standard type of Zinfandel now produced uh, in the state. Most wineries producing Zinfandel will produce Zinfandel at about 12%. There are a few Zinfandels, and that's the Krug type of Zinfandel normally. Krug is producing Zinfandel at 12%. At Martini's, on the other hand, the best Zinfandels will run almost 13%, and in some years, 13%. The famous Martini 36, the 1940, uh, the 1968 are all wines approaching 13% uh, alcohol, and they were the ones that aged the longest also. Whether to blend in the press wine. If it's going to give you a lot of extra sugar, I would say no. Uh, but if it's the grapes do not have many raisin berries, then I would think that the press wine would have no particular harm. But sometimes when you press Zinfandel, just a second, sometimes when you press Zinfandel, you literally just press out raisin grape juice. And that, of course, increases the alcohol more and gives it that raisiny character. Yes? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If it's just uh, you know, highly certain, why don't you just do that to increase the alcohol? Well, I don't want the raisin character. That's the real problem there. That's why I wouldn't use the pressed wine in that case. I think if a Zinfandel tastes like raisins, it's probably gotten too raisined, and, but 13% it shouldn't be too much. Shouldn't be too much. No blending with non-Zinfandel, yes, I think that's correct. Blending of different years, I don't see any real problem there, except that it cuts down the number of special type wines, which I've indicated is a general problem up under number one. How long to age, I think that depends on the alcohol content. Um, for the 13%, certainly three years is not too long. And how long to maturity? Not too much different from Cabernet, faster than Pinot Noir, not as fast as Cabernet. Uh, the 68, you see, which is five years old now, it's one and a half, two years since bottling, uh, is not yet mature by quite a bit. Uh, some of the earlier ones are approaching maturity. What should a Zinfandel taste like? It has to be fruity. That's been the experience all the way back to Horasthi, that Zinfandel has a very fruity character. It said people, various people have said the raspberry-like smell. I'm not sure that's correct. I've never smelt raspberries in Zinfandel, but certainly something very distinctive. I just call it the Zinfandel odor. My predecessor, Professor Bialetti, claimed publicly that he could recognize Zinfandel down to 30%. Uh, I don't think that I could do that at all. I don't think I can recognize some Zinfandels that are supposed to be 100%. <laughs> but I do think that uh, they ought to at least have a recognizable Zinfandel character. Not too hard to do. To make a good Zinfandel may be difficult, but to make a passably sound Zinfandel is not a difficult problem. Not nearly as difficult a problem as Pinot Noir. Not nearly as difficult a problem. Now, Merlot, which you have a fair amount of, and which you have a lot of in Argentina and other places, has a very mild Cabernet aroma. Uh, Winkler and I, some years ago, uh, uh, right after the war, went back and took out all the Merlots, experimental Merlots, and had them tasted blind with Cabernets. In about two-thirds of the cases, the Merlots were identified as Cabernet odor. And I think that makes sense because you would expect uh, if Cabernet is sort of the basic or parent variety in the Bordeaux region, then uh, that uh, you would expect all the 
varieties to be clones of Cabernet at some time or other in their history, and the Merlot, representing some early offshoot 100, 200 years ago, would have some Cabernet aroma. The problem of the Merlot is not the problem of its Cabernet aroma. The problem of the Merlot is the rainy years. Uh, it's a very nice variety in a warm, dry fall. But in a, and this is true in Bordeaux as well, but in the Bordeaux region, and also in California, when you have early rainfall and continued high humidity, it rots, whereas Cabernet does not. And I guess that would have been another correct answer to that question of how do you justify the mixture of varieties in Bordeaux, that in the rainy years, the Merlot, the, the Cabernet helps to carry the Merlot through, whereas in the dry years, the Merlot produces an early maturing wine which helps to mature the Cabernet earlier so that they work together in the, in the right, right, the hot years as against the rainy years. It's very easy to crush and very easy to ferment, as is Cabernet, I might point out. And the pressing is not too long delayed, three and four days here in California, and it doesn't do much good to leave it on the skins much longer than that. With Cabernet, with a big seed, to the small volume, you see the Cabernet has a very small berry and a large seed, there are some advantages to the longer time on the skin because you pick up more tannin for aging, as Dr. Singleton has pointed out to you. With the Merlot, which is a big berry and a small seed, leaving it on the skins much more doesn't pick up nearly as much tannin. So that if you're looking for high tannins and slow aging, well, you get that much easier from Cabernet than you will from Merlot. And I don't think it makes a great deal of difference whether you use the pressed wine or not for the same reason. Mostly they have a malolactic fermentation. And it's fairly easy malolactic fermentation based on our experience here. Well, it does reduce the aging time of Cabernet. But on the other hand, it has a soft, uh, slightly distinct character of its own. Uh, there are at least two Merlots on the market now, or will be this fall, just as Merlots. The other hand, for many years, the Merlots at Ingleduck have been used to blend, and uh, quite successfully, I might say, since I like the Ingleduck Cabernets quite well. So I'm not saying what uh, the policy should be. I think that's up to every each individual winery, as it is in Bordeaux. It's become much more popular in this century. Less than 20% of the Bordeaux acreage was Merlot at the turn of the century. Now it's about 40%, so it's more than doubled in popularity in Bordeaux in this century. Well, the Ruby Cabernet started off with great promise, my own included, and great hopes, my own included. Unfortunately, uh, quite a lot of it was planted in region one and two, which it was not intended for and was not recommended for. Uh, there were a lot of growers in those areas who were tired of getting small crops from those old marginal Cabernet vineyards that they had going back into Prohibition and earlier. And so they saw the Ruby Cabernet as a chance to get a lot of Cabernet uh, per acre uh, very quickly. Unfortunately, it was all virus infected. It all had red leaf. And the result was that they never got ripe in those regions. So there were acid Ruby Cabernets produced from about 1938 on and continued for quite a long while until we got to working on the virus problem. The second problem of the Ruby Cabernet was the disappointment in Lodi as compared to Davis. The Davis results were pretty good. I don't know whether that was because we grew the grapes ourselves and we took a certain amount of pride in the new variety, which was a Davis creation, but uh, they, they were fairly soft, it's true, but they had a lot of Cabernet character and uh, they seemed to be in fairly good condition. They didn't have that high pH smell of the Cabernet Sauvignon Cabernets from Davis. So in a number of cases, the Ruby Cabernet from Davis actually had better quality scores than the Cabernet Sauvignon from Davis. And most often that was true, both before and after the war. But Lodi Ruby Cabernets, so far as I know, without exception, commercial ones now I'm talking about, have all been very flat. And far, far too much malolactic fermentation. So that in many cases they have the sauerkraut smell, or have had the sauerkraut smell. And so although the variety was created for region four, 
I don't know of a single high quality Ruby Cabernet that's come out of Region 4 at the present time, except experimental wines here on the Davis campus. So just where I would put Ruby Cabernet today and how I would use it, I think is a very good question. I would do everything possible to prevent the malolactic fermentation. I would do everything possible to keep the grapes from being virus infected so you'd get a better sugar acid balance. You wouldn't have to leave them on the vine so long to get them ripe. Some of those red leaf vines just never did ripen, even in region four. I think I'd raise the acidity if there was any question that there was going to have a malolactic fermentation that would lower the acidity too much. Uh, and I would certainly take another look at the microflora of the winery I was working in to see if there was any relationship to the, to the malolactic fermentation. Something should be done to make the Ruby Cabernets more fruity. They have plenty of Cabernet flavor. At their best, when the sugar acid ratio is good, the Cabernet and Ruby Cabernet will fool you for Cabernet Sauvignon almost every time. But that doesn't happen very much. For some reason, the acidity drops out of the Ruby Cabernet fairly rapidly. And it's got too much acid for regions one and two. So that its ideal region is going to be somewhere between three and four, and it's going to require much more attention than we had any idea for. I would place the Ruby Cabernet next to Pinot Noir as being the most difficult variety we have to identify well in California at the present time. Um, I'm sure it can be made into a good wine, um, but uh, the number of times it's been successful has not been very great. As I've said, the relative lack of success, I think, is due to the non-ripening, the late harvesting, and the excessive malolactic fermentation. It should taste Cabernet, and it should not taste flat. It should not have any of that flat characteristic that so many of them have. There was at least one case, ran on for several years, in which the Ruby Cabernets were aged in 50-gallon barrels. And they got so woody that they were very unpleasant for that reason. Also, if everything else being equal, you'll lose more tartrates in a 50-gallon barrel than you will in a 5,000-gallon tank. So that helped to make them even flatter than they already were. I'm going to emphasize again that, that the reason that Ruby Cabernet was developed was to provide a high acid variety for Region 4. And it tastes better with a reasonably high acid, 6.5. Most of the commercial Ruby Cabernets have been produced at only 5 or 5.5. Five and they've been flat and dead on the palate. Um, more attention to the vinification of Ruby Cabernet would be a, a great help to making a better wine. I look with some fear about the Petit Syrah increase in acreage. Uh, a good part of it was planted during Prohibition because it shipped well to the Eastern market. But it both bunch rot, sunburns, and sunburns. And that uh, can be very disastrous. It bunch rots when there's high humidity. It sunburns when you get excessive afternoon temperatures. There's 108 several times last year in the Napa Valley. And has been 117 at Calistoga at one time, official temperature. It seemed to me it was hotter than that. but. Um, so that you get very high alcohol Petit Syrahs in many years. We had some experimental samples here in 1936, which as you know is a very hot year, that ran up 15 and 16 percent alcohol with, uh, with no help at all from the fermentation. They just fermented up that much. So they get a very raisiny character. They do retain their acidity pretty well, however. I'll have to say that for the Petit Syrah. The other major problem about the Petit Syrah is it just doesn't have much varietal character. Of all the varieties we've had up to this, it has the least varietal character. And therefore, you can hardly expect it to shine out as a great and shining light in the industry. Now, I know why people are making Petit Syrahs. They're trying to get out of the Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, Triumvirate control. And I would too if I were in the industry. I think that's perfectly sound reasoning. Not just to have three, but to try and have some wines that other people don't have. But I'm not sure the Petit Syrah is the final answer. I think it makes a very nice wine. It ages quite well. 
but it'll have problems in the early rainfall years and it's going to have problems in the hot years or small crop years. Uh, the experience has been that it ages about like Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's a fairly slow aging wine. So it's going to have to be kept in the wood and then aged in the bottle. What should it taste like? I really can't tell you since it doesn't have very much varietal character. Certainly should develop some bouquet, I would say, and I don't think you'll confuse it with Pinot Noir or Cabernet. So by elimination, you might be able to separate the Petit Syrahs from those first seven, but uh, that would be the way to get at it, would be just, and that isn't a very great, uh, identifying artist by what they are not is not the best way of identifying them. And that's what, essentially what you're doing there. Oh, now there's a spelling error. There's an um, error in the text here. As a red table, that should be. As a red table wine. In, in juxtaposition to Gamay as a rosé table wine. So if you change thin to table, that's my calligraphy. Gamay doesn't have hardly any varietal character. Uh, we're talking about Napa Valley Gamay now, which is the Gamay of Beaujolais. Uh, I gather that Sterling thinks that um, that uh, leaving the whole grapes under carbon dioxide will help it to get some character, and it may give it a different flavor. But just by itself, it's not doesn't have much character. It's going to take some help to have much character of its own. The same thing is true of Carignan. Without the e, if you're spelling it in France, with the e, if you're spelling it in California, final e on Carignan is not used in France. Uh, Carignan just is a wonderful producer, but it bunch rots very easily. Uh, I've seen Carignans growing down the valley in irrigated vineyards where you could just look at the, on both sides of the vines, these were trained so that the canes were in both directions, and you could see a row of red juice down the, right underneath the vines where the clusters had leaked out juice from the, from the bunch rot. Uh, and you could smell the Carignan block before you even got out of the car from acetification. But up in the coast counties, it does very well, and it, although it's hard to control mildew in it, it doesn't bunch rot. John Daniel always thought that nobody had paid enough attention to Carignan in California and that somebody might make a good Carignan. My objection was that even if they made the best Carignan that was ever made, who would ever know it was Carignan? because it doesn't have very much distinctive character. Now, Barbera is a rather perplexing variety. I know at least two wineries should make Barbera. None of them have the high acidity associated with experimental lots. Even the experimental lots made from the grapes in the vineyard, where these commercial wines are being made. That is because we did not, and sometimes still do not, get a malolactic fermentation in our wines here, whereas industry-wide always encourages a malolactic fermentation of Barbera, and I think they get too much of it. I would rather see the Barbera with a little bit more acid, a little bit more tartness to it. Um, I cannot describe Barbera, but um, um, Mr. Barabetta, who was our vineyard foreman for 25 or 30 years, uh, was very good at it. So I think you've got to be born in Piedmont and uh, grow up with Barbera. Use Barbera for weaning purposes and so forth. <laughs> and uh, then maybe you can, you can tell Barbera from other wines. Mondus has been used almost entirely in California uh, as a blending grape for Cabernet Sauvignon. Valdepinus is too low in acid and I see no place for Valdepinus in the industry. And Charbonne, undoubtedly an Italian grape, has aged very nicely, and when quite old, I like it very much, but it's the bouquet I like, not the aroma. It doesn't have much aroma, but has a nice bouquet when aged and will age very well. Now, they've been bottling a little earlier and not keeping it at Inglenook in recent years, but if you can find a 10 or 12-year-old Charbonne in the bottle, you'll find a rather nice wine. It's a very clean grape. Never saw a rotten Charbonne grape yet. Every single berry is separated from every other berry. Uh, nice, round, slightly flattened grapes. Uh, very easy to pick, very easy to ferment. 
not much character when they're young, and then they age and they develop some bouquet. Well, i uh, spend just a few moments then on the generic types, since that's the kind of wines that we're selling the most. The argument in ABC was for two kinds of red generic wines in California. One would be a low color claret type uh, of a, uh, 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 with a rel relatively low alcohol, uh, something around 11.5% um, alcohol, moderate color, fruity, early maturing wine. The other would be for a higher color, higher alcohol, higher tannin, a uh, red wine, which would be the California Burgundy type. And um, I still think that makes sense, but uh, there are as many different clarets and burgundies in California as there are wineries at the present time. There are just tremendous differences between wineries and their concept of what a burgundy should be and of what a uh, claret should be. And even within the same winery, there's a big uh, difference. Some wineries produce two burgundies in two price ranges. One of them will be sweet, 2.5% sugar, and the other one will be dry. Uh, and they may change from one year to the next. One year they'll be lighter in color, the next year they're higher in color. The best place to see this was at the State Fair, judging. Uh, there they were all in front of you, blind, 17 California Burgundies in a row, and some of them would be as light as clarets, or even lighter than clarets, would be almost rosés, and others would be so dark in color that you couldn't see through them. Uh, the problem may solve itself with time. There is very little claret being produced at the present time. And claret is selling a discount, so that the lowest priced wines are usually clarets. And red Chianti, which was the other one that Cruz and I were anxious to get rid of, has been dying a natural death, I'm glad to say. I hope that we hastened that. The rosé problem, I want to just pass on a couple of comments. I've, I've just about had the sweet rosés as far as I'm personally concerned, but uh, if there's a demand for it, well, you, it will certainly continue to be produced. My objection to the sweet rosé is that you can't drink very much of it. And it seems to me if you're going to have a rosé, it ought to be something that you can quaff a whole glass and then have another glass. If you try the sweet rosés, you're not going to get through the first glass until you're going to be satisfied. That's my experience, my personal experience, and I perhaps drink as much as any two people here in normal times. <laughs> uh, so I have some feeling for that problem. They keep it fresh and dry and keep the color sharp and pink and not purple and not orange and not sweeten it, I would be much happier. If they have to sweeten it, let them label it. Mildly dry or something like that. So that I would be forewarned and forearmed and buy something else. But they won't do that, of course. The Grenache problem is that it has a bitter taste. And I, um, I do not agree that the best rosés are going to be made from Grenache, although the industry still feels that's true. I'm still willing to admit that it has a place in the industry. I think the Gamay makes a better rosé than the Grenache does day in and day out. I do not like to see Cabernet rosés and Pinot Noir rosés. That seems to me a cop-out. If you're going to make a Cabernet, you ought to make a Cabernet. If you're going to make a Pinot Noir, you ought to make a Pinot Noir. The Green Alino problem is complicated by how many different Green Alinos there are in California. At least the, the one that the university has, the one that Joe Heights has, and the one that somebody in California Wine Association keeps in the back of their mind as a blending concept. And so uh, we have at least three different kinds of Green Alino on the market. Uh, the Italian Green Alino, from the major clones, but not from all the clones, is pink, but with uh, more tannin than the regular rosés have. Uh, and if you take the university's Green Alino and make it into wine, that's what you get. And presumably ours is authentic here. On the other hand, I don't think there's much future for a Green Alino that's rosé and tannic. I think that's why it's never become popular in Piedmont and not likely to be popular here. So I think that Joe has the right idea. Joe Heights has the right idea. If you're going to make Green Alino, make it to be an early maturing pink wine of low tannin content. Now, um, you don't need to hand... 